Hello everyone, this is Bradley. Today this is a tutorial about a different knitting animation. Last time I talked about the two principles and showcased each of them. I emphasized the customizability and the user's responsibility to choose the methods and so on. This time we will do a different animation, but with slightly different steps to meet some different scenarios and learn some extra knowledge. I highly encourage you to watch the last tutorial and then move on to this one. So here we are in Blender Nodes Editor. Last time we were working on a plane. This time we will start with a more complex geometry, Susan has. This is a mesh object. However, as we need to work with a lot of curves, you should keep Susan selected and uh, add a new empty hair curve object. This new hair curve object will be the child of Susan. I will Alt P to remove this relationship. The new hair curve has its default node tree. I will remove all contents and drag and drop the Suzanne into the node tree. Now I can hide the original Suzanne because it's reference and showing our new hair curve object. When using the new hair curve, it's important to change the render setting away from the default strength. Otherwise, your curve will not have any thickness. I will set it to the cylinder in this tutorial. Last time we talked about two general knitting principles, such as the instancing methods with instancing um, points versus deformation method with sample UV surface. Technically speaking, you could replicate what we taught in the last tutorial, but I emphasize that it's your responsibility to choose the method you want. Whether you use instancing methods, deformation methods, or a hybrid of both methods. This time I will do slightly different scenarios where I want larger chunks of knitting patterns instead of very detailed tiny structures at this time. If you use the instancing methods, here I have prepared a modified node tree from the last tutorial. And let's pick the custom object as our Susan head and increase the radius for a clear result. You see, we have kind of very ugly results with lots of extrusions uh, because there's no deformation along the surface to fit the curvature. So they will just be straight popping out from the surface. If you increase the subdivision level, then you will immediately see an improvement in the results. There are other tiny issues I noticed related with the rotation of instances, but these are easy to fix and I will not discuss them in details now. Therefore, the instancing method will not be very favorable for what I wish to do this time. We will use the UV deformer method for the main structure, which is not really dependent on the resolution, but on the UV map instead. So let's remove the sample UV surface and add the UV deformer. We already have the surface as a Suzanne head. We need to prepare a knitting pattern to deform it itself on the Suzanne head. Generally speaking, this knitting pattern can be made in various forms. So I have a knit surface preset to simplify the tedious process. This knit surface contains two modes. One mode is simply instancing the knitting units on the 2D plane. You have met this knit unit in the last tutorial with the instancing method. Let's zoom in to look at the details. If you scale up the x-axis, you will find their unconnected pieces with gaps in between. The other mode is done by deforming linear strands. If you decrease the amplitudes on all axes, you are recovering their original look as the straight lines. They are deformed with sine function, which I have explained in the past. Both are sitting on a 2D plane, and they cannot be put onto an object surface without UV deformer. So here I set radius factor back to default one, and I will plug in my knitting pattern as the deforming geometry and the Suzanne as my guide surface. You can immediately see a very good result in the viewport. Our original Suzanne has its default UV map called UV map, which matches the name of the UV set by default. So everything works automatically. You see the results of the demonstration is much better than the instancing we saw previously at such a low count 
and this is the advantage of the deformation method. The principle has been explained in the past in the sample UV surface tutorial, but I will explain it briefly here again. If you enable preview, you will see our pattern has been remapped to the region of 0, 0 and 1, 1, which is the typical range for the UV map. In fact, if you decrease the radius, you can see there is a mesh laying underneath our knitting pattern. This is the unwrapped UV map for Suzanne. And if you check her validity, you will see curves outside the boundaries are being removed. And then we transfer this UV mapping result to the 3D surface. And we end up with this result. You can add a subdivision surface to smooth the Suzanne model a little bit. Right now, you probably notice that originally all knitting patterns are very compact, but when they are deformed on Suzanne, they look very sparse. This is because the UV map has been stretched over these curved surfaces. That's why some parts are very sparse, while other parts, such as in the region around the ears, are quite compact. Here, we will solve this UV map issue by tweaking our parameters. So here, I'm going to increase the level of the knit surface. You see, it becomes smaller and more compact while retaining the structure and the patterns. That's why presetting these functions is so important and useful. Otherwise, I would have trillions of parameters to deal with. Now, going out of preview, we have more compact patterns despite the stretched UV map. Let's also increase the radius factor to fill in the additional gaps. One more thing I need to tweak is the normal factor on the 3D surface. We need to compensate the height or amplitude of the original knit surface, so it looks more perfect for the interlacing patterns. To conclude this UV deformer method, this method provides a lot more flexibility than just the instancing. Because your geometry is no longer limited to instancing these tiny units, it's also much easier to make such a complex setup or animation on a plane as you can later pass the information to the 3D surface. This method obviously has downsides compared to the instancing method as well. Firstly, it requires a good UV map. Just now, we are dealing with the issue of UVs. Secondly, to deform these units, there must be real geometry, such as mesh, curve, or points, and they must not be instances. Third problem is that if you are doing any kind of animation, you will encounter an integrity problem because there could be seams which cut the UV islands into pieces. And thus, originally your setup is a complete whole structure, but upon validity check and the deformation, things will be split and cause weirdness. So animation before deformation is quite possible, but very often may not be straightforward due to the presence of these seams and the cuts. You may have to do the animation after the deformation steps, and that's basically what we are going to do. The animation in this case can be simple because it's similar to what we did in the previous tutorial. This time I will use directional fourth instead of the proximity fourth. Firstly, let's set the curve radius so we are mimicking a disappearance effect. Let's pick an empty object for better animation control. I will change the empty type from sphere to arrows for better visualization of directional fourth. Outputting it to the set curve radius, then we have a gradient from 0 to 1 as indicated by the empty from one side to the other. I will remap 0 to 1 and set it to a high value to recover our default thickness earlier. And I will use a color ramp to exaggerate this relationship. You can use empty to play with this transition animation, but you find it's a bit too flat. Let's add a vector noise, increase the frequency, and decrease the factor to skew the position evaluation so that our fourth boundary becomes a bit more interesting. 
Next, let's add the noise displacement with set position and noise 3D. Increasing the frequency and scale will make everything crazy. Let's duplicate the color ramp from the fourth and use it. I will reverse the relationship. So overall, we are having noise displacements on the boundary of disappearing. Next, let's add some additional details. We do the same as last time with tiny hair. If your mesh doesn't have any animation, we can directly use hair on geometry, which instances these tiny hairs on the surface. Let's increase the count to visualize them more clearly. You can add more rotation, increase length, and even enable surface clean, so it looks like the hairs are crossing over the surface of our geometry. If you are looking for animation with fall, we use the same directional fall and plug it into the prepared fall socket. You can see the result of how empty driving the appearance effect. Finally, you can join both geometry to see how it looks. Sometimes you can decrease the radius to make these extra hairs more subtle. It's also possible to tweak various settings to change the hair type, or even duplicate it to make various types of tiny hair. For simplicity of our tutorials, I will only use one hair on geometry. So now we have completed the major animation. You may wonder what the principle is for adding hairs using the hair on geometry nodes. The answer is very simple. It's using the instancing method. We're instancing tiny hairs and deforming them afterwards. You can even see a realize instance option on our preset. So basically, we are doing the opposite of what we did the last time. We have deformation method on the top for major knitting patterns and the instancing method for tiny hairs to make up details. Last time we used the instancing method for the major netting pattern, and thus it was resolution dependent and only looked nice at high subdivision. And we used the UVD form on the random hairs to accommodate the animation of the plane. This time we have to make a different decision because at low resolution, the instancing method with netting units will generate ugly results. And the UV deformer method is less dependent on the resolution so that we can have these nice curvatures with big chunk of knitting patterns. This again emphasizes that we generally have two options to procedurally generate knitting patterns and hairs. But you always have to pick the correct method by yourself for your specific case and requirements. Please be aware that uh, both methods are similarly complicated. Although it may look like the node tree from the previous tutorial is a lot more complicated, that's because we added more functions and features which are not done in our tutorial today for the sake of simplicity. At the end, let's finish the animation. Although not done in the render file, let's add the lines this time as well. Since we are not using the instancing method at all, we need to do some tricky workarounds to place the points for instancing. I will add an array on curves to generate the points, and then instance some points to instance our curve line. Let's uncenter it and put it on the z-axis. We realize the instance in order to render this hair curve. Set curve radius to change the thickness, and I want these lines to spread out. So let's add a line rotation to points as we did in the past. You can change the parameters however you want, but I will move on by restricting these lines to show only the newly appearing region. So let's duplicate the color ramp from the fourth. I will add a 0, 1, 0 gradient. And uh, we can control the empty to visualize the animation, which looks fine to me. For materials, we need a set material node. Add the material 
which I will call it the tutorial. And in the node tree, pick this tutorial material. In the shader editor, we need a attribute in order to call the UV map. And in the image texture, I've already prepared the Blender logo. In material preview, it seems to work, but actually no. If you isolate to our major pattern, you find it's black because we need to store a UV map for our image texture. Then we move on into the extra lines. It looks they inherit the UV map from our storage earlier. But to be safe, I will sample the UV map and store it again. You can find there are some tiny differences which may not be very prominent or important, but I need to mention it in case you find any problems in the future for your project. At last, hair on geometry as an instancing method will also automatically inherit the UV from the starting geometry like our lines. However, as our random hairs are crossing over the surface, I will sample the nearest surface to store the UV map. You can compare and contrast uh, with or without this new storage to see how the results has been changed. Generally speaking, it will be more accurate in this case to use sample nearest the surface. At this stage, you might think the image texture looks ugly and worry that something went wrong in this setup. But this is partly because Suzanne's UV map does not match our image texture very well. I believe that when you are working with your actual project, the UV map and the image texture will be a perfect match. So this is all about it. I hope that this tutorial will reinforce your understanding from the previous one and give you some more ideas about how these two principles play out in the setup. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I will probably see you next time. Bye-bye.